opportunity to have some really incredible conversations, and I'm hoping that will happen tonight. Um, I'm not going to say too much because we want to move on to the film and also make sure we have time to hear from Brian and Will from ACT UP at the end um, of the discussion so that we can bring what we see in the film, which is really reflecting back on the history of ACT UP, um, into the present uh, contemporary situation and also into the UK context because this film largely focuses on ACT UP in the United States. So um, I am going to just say that and say that we're going to watch the film and afterwards um, Brian and Will are going to kind of lead a, a sort of response and Q&A session. Um, do you want to say anything, Brian and Will? Thank you so much for being here. Will Nutland. Oh, there you go. My name is Will Nutland. I'm, uh, I'm a research fellow at the London School of Hygiene uh, and Tropical Medicine. But in a former life, um, I was the co-founder of ACT UP Norwich over in the east of England um, and took part in a, in a wide range of, of demonstrations and, and, and activist activities, um, not just in Norwich, but um, I was part of um, a, a group of ACT UP activists that formed a kind of a federal ACT UP UK um, that came together for a period of about about two years um, in, um, and helped to regenerate and regalvanize what was going on, uh, particularly with ACT UP London. And then also, um, on two occasions, had the, um, the great opportunity to go and be part of um, ACT UP uh, international activism at two of the international AIDS conferences in, in both Amsterdam and Berlin in 92 and 93. That makes me feel very, very old. <laughs> Um, and my name is Brian Mullen. Uh, I'm American, as you can tell from my accent, but I've been in the UK for the, nearly six years now. And I am, uh, I work in the theatre. I'm a theatre maker and a writer. But um, there's a new chapter of ACT UP London active for about the last year and a half. So I'm here representing our group and have uh, some sort of updates after you've seen this film as to kind of what we're doing now and uh, what we're focusing on as the, as the new issues and sort of the second silence around HIV. Um, I, I, has anybody seen United in Anger before? That's great. Uh, so for a lot of you, this is brand new. The only thing I'll say to preface the film, um, it comes from a wonderful um, initiative called the ACT UP Oral History Project which I think is all freely available online at that uh, website, ACT UP Oral History Project. So um, it's really an amazing um, document that we're about to see, and then I think it'll be really interesting to, um, to respond and hear what everyone has to say afterwards. Do we want to say anything else, Will? No, that's okay. good. Okay, thanks. Thank you, guys, uh, everyone, for coming. Um, I know that we don't have an enormous amount of time, uh, although I think there's the opportunity perhaps when this space has to close down to continue the conversation outside. But um, in addition to just getting questions and responses, we've brought some images that Will has provided and I've provided just to also give some sense of um, what's happened with ACT UP in the UK. Uh, in the 90s and also now. So I'm just, while Will starts talking, I'll get those images up on the screen if we can. Um, you know, when I, when I came in earlier, um, Brian asked me if I'd seen the film before, and I'd actually thought I'd seen um, How to Survive a Plague, but I had, I had seen this one before, and I'd, I'd, I'd quite forgotten how gut-wrenching it is to sit and watch some of that. And I'd, I know Brian and I, at one point, were both a little teary and a little shaky, and you're probably still feeling that from now. But I, having been involved in ACT UP internationally, watching some of those faces of people I knew and then saying the, the, the dates when they died and, and, and watching again, a, a couple of people I hadn't actually realised had passed away is is um, something I think we need to acknowledge when we go back and look at some of that, that history. So I was in, as I said at the start, and I think um, in just a second, Brian is going to um, expose my young self to you. <laughs> there you go. That was me, uh, 1993, the International AIDS Conference. There was a, um, an, 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 an activist, an active activist from, um, I think, possibly New York. He was called Bill, and he did a, a photo documentary of, um, of AIDS activists from around the world. So I was um, like some of the guys in the film in my early 20s then. And I think one of the things that really resonated for me from the film was one of the guys talking about what a sexy thing it was to be involved, what is, how sexy it was to be an AIDS activist. And I can remember um, I went to university um, 
in, in Norwich. I can remember going to those first international AIDS conferences and feeling that very energy that we saw at the Lesbian and Gay Centre there in New York of hundreds of people being in a room, um, planning what actions they were going to do over the next 10 days, and very much that sense of it was one of the hottest places to be in the world. A lot of very, very sexy people and an awful lot of making out happening. And I can remember, you know, I was this, this young queer boy from, uh, from Norwich and suddenly confronted with this room full of the sexiest people ever. And I've got some great tales to tell if anyone wants to ask me later. But, but um, should we move to it? I wanted to just kind of... Uh, we didn't have... We didn't galvanise those huge kind of thousands of people in street demonstrations I mean, in any of our ACT-UP groups in the UK. Um, London didn't manage to do that. And, and I, I, again, some of the tales of what went on with ACT-UP in, in, in New York started to resonate. Some of the fallouts, some of the things like that. Um, we started experiencing them in, in the UK as well. And there are, I, I think there are, were kind of four generations of ACT UP that happened in the UK, of which Brian is, is the kind of the, one of the people who's founded the fourth generation. But each of those three generations that I look back and observe actually only lasted about eight months, uh, 18 months, uh, 12 to 18 months um, for each generation because of various infighting or political fighting that those of you who've been involved in, in activism in the UK will know is, is quite common. Um, that aside, um, one of the big things that we did in, in the early 90s, around 92, some of you might remember that Benetton put out a fairly controversial advert of a, of a man dying, dying of HIV-related illness. And, and looking back, I don't know if it was right that we, we were so angry about, about this advert as we were, but we led um, masses of demonstrations um, against Benetton. We had lots of things called try it on in Benetton days when basically we would all go in and try jumpers on and then not pay for them and leave the shop a mess. <laughs> um, but we did one in, in Norwich on um, what was probably the high street, I don't remember the name of the shop, and got fairly boldly pushed out by the shop manager's um, burly boyfriend very quickly. But we managed to protest for the rest of the afternoon. One of the things that I think helps to explain why AIDS activism in what I call the third generation of AIDS activism um, diminished was the change in police tactics, the change in uh, UK legislation, particularly the Public Order Act. And for any of those of you who've been following the recent stories in The Guardian, how secret police started to infiltrate our activist movement um, in, in, the, in the early 90s. And there was a, several years after we did this, the, the Benetton demonstrations, uh, two members of ACT UP and seven members of Outrage demonstrated at Benetton's headquarters and in a fairly nasty way um, got attacked, got arrested and then faced a really lengthy um, court case when actually had they been found guilty, most of them, including my partner at the time, would have spent three or four years in prison. And luckily the judge um, overturned, um, di didn't, didn't, didn't uh, find them guilty and criticised Benetton um, for bringing the action um, in the first place. But let's move on. Um, we borrowed some of the great ideas from New York. I'm partway through the documentary there. You might remember the advert called Kissing Doesn't Kill. So we begged, borrowed and, and stole those ideas. But also one of the things we were doing in the UK was that we were also doing education campaigns. We were doing prevention work because it was so willfully adequate in many cases. So these are examples of, um, of beer mats that we used in Norwich that we were throwing around and on the back side had um, information about um, HIV prevention and, and and uh, national local um, AIDS phone line numbers in the, the bottom right hand corner. This uh, cartoon, um, go back, at, um, by David Shenton, some of you might be familiar with. It's actually me and my boyfriend at the time modelling for him. <laughs> so there you go. We got on thousands of beer mats. Let's switch forward. Let's, let's go on another one. Um, or we're not going to have much time. Can we go to the next yeah. one? So one of the, one of the main things we were doing in the early 90s was trying to, um, trying to get legislation overturned um, around employment discrimination. Some of you might remember um, in 20 years ago that Texaco had a pre-employment HIV testing policy. So if you wanted to go for a job and work for Texaco, there was a compulsory HIV test. If you refused to take that test or if you tested positive, you weren't allowed to work for them. Um, looking back 20 years ago, that now seems outstanding that le le that legislation could be put in place. Um, but you'll see on the on the uh, the Texaco out of order stickers, um, we had thousands of these printed. 
and at the time 24 hour Tesco garages would generally in the night time only have one person working in them who, and these people were forbidden to come outside of the locked booth they were in so by going in night time way before CCTV cameras um, were there to record these kind of activities activists would go and plant these wretched and fluorescent orange um, Tesco out of order for HIV discrimination stickers on the petrol pumps um, at 8 o'clock in the evening once the pump attendant was there on his or her own and that meant that basically for 12 hours anyone who came by would see the sticker think it said Texco out of order and then <laughs> um, they would lose money for the night so we kind of started rather than having great big demonstrations on the streets these were the kind of ways that ACT UP started to operate quite locally um, no, let's stay with that one so um, yeah move on um, so this one was um, at Norwich Prison, um, and we catapulted condoms and lubricant over the walls of the prison in a day of um, European international action. Um, our colleagues at ACT UP Paris um, organised a day of action when right across Europe we went and tried to get condoms um, and lube into prison. There's a slightly nice story there. For, uh, Zena is with the catapult firing condoms and lube um, over the prison gates. Um, the prison warders on the other side were furiously going around trying to pick them up. We put them inside tennis balls. Um, and then um, the police came and confiscated uh, our, our, um, our catapults um, and finally returned them to us on condition that we wouldn't do, do the same thing again. And we found out that the, the woman police officer who had taken them away from us was called WPC Dyke, which was a, kind of a nice, uh, nice story. Um, let's move on. Yeah, so um, w at the very beginning of the, of the documentary, one of the guys is talking about how, uh, how Reagan's administration um, might consider internment camps. Actually, it was under, um, George, under Bill Clinton's um, presidency that we saw internment camps and um, Guantanamo Bay, um, a prison camp now known for something very different, um, actually interned Haitians with HIV who were trying to uh, get into the States. And this is a, um, a fax campaign when we faxed the White House from right the way around the world to get Bill Clinton to release people. And nice little historical thing you'll see on the right-hand bottom side, the little red mark of, um, if you remember when we used to send faxes, the little red mark was an indication that the fax had gone through. <laughs> and so we sent that dozens and dozens of times. Um, Brian, let's, let's move to you. Yeah, so you can see this is the um, mission statement of ACT UP London, and I'll just quickly talk about what we're doing now. Um, the group sort of formed right at the end of... Um, 2013, actually, we, we staged a screening of the other um, ACT UP documentary, which is worth seeing, um, How to Survive a Plague. Some of you may have seen that. Um, and I think, you know, our group is an interesting, um, ever-evolving and shifting formation of people. I mean, to look at the numbers that were coming um, in New York in the heyday of ACT UP, we're, we're not doing that but we are trying to learn from their kind of organic structure and their idea that the people who are in the room and want to take on certain causes are the, you know, are the ones who are going to make this happen in the way that we can make it happen. Um, we, as you can see from the first paragraph there, we've definitely drawn on the um, uh, mission statement that you heard repeated in the in the film, but we also had to ask ourselves questions about what does it mean today in the UK to be ACT UP. Um, not all of the issues are the same. Some of them are still with us. But, um, you know, I, speaking as an American, I mean, I get most emotional in that film when I think about um, people not having universal health coverage, and that's still... A, a huge issue in the United States even after Obama's reforms. Um, luckily, here in the UK, the National Health Service does provide um, antiretroviral uh, medication, not just to British citizens, but to, to anyone who's residing in the UK, um, and they, because they feel that that is a, an important public health measure, and I think that is a, an, an amazing thing, but it's also something that's under threat. And so as we think about what the issues are that we've wanted to focus on, it, we felt it's important that the people understand that the AIDS, crisis, the 
AIDS crisis in the UK maybe is all over in, in a sense. People aren't dying of AIDS, but HIV as a pandemic and as an important issue is not over in the UK, particularly among young gay men, actually. I believe I'm correct in this, Will, that infection rates are, have been rising among that population. As w and, and of course, it doesn't just affect gay men, as we know. It affects many other groups. Um, our very first action, you can see me there, um, <laughs> bearing my midriff slightly, it was around the uh, 2014 immigration bill. So that's us outside the um, uh, home office. And our slogan was docs, not cops, because buried within the immigration bill, which had many pernicious aspects if you, you know, want Britain to be a welcoming country, were um, very important and, and serious changes to the way that healthcare is administered for people who are legal migrants to this country. We're not even talking about people who are undocumented, but people who are legal migrants who've come here and may pay taxes um, are forced to pay uh, new surcharges, which are now going into action. Um, basically, the, it links the Home Office to the um, Department of Health, and it's the first time that people are being charged for, for certain kinds of things. We, this doesn't just uh, affect HIV, but we feel that it particularly affects HIV, because um, if people are afraid to go to the doctor, if they think their doctor might be reporting on their immigration status, then um, you know they're not going to go in and get tested. They're not going to go in and get checks. They're going to wait until a condition which maybe is undetected gets very serious. And so they're, we've continued to fight this. And we, there's an affinity group that's spun off from our ACT UP um, chapter, which is called Docs Not Cops. And, and they're very active now protesting outside of hospitals and basically talking about we can't have border controls in our NHS hospitals. Um, the cause of migrants and HIV was then taken up by our friend Nigel Farage, who uh, I have to say he's probably done more to increase the um, attendance at our meetings than anyone else in the last 12 months. Um, it began after the um, election of Douglas Carswell. He made some outrageously factually inaccurate um, statements about HIV and how it gets spread and what other countries do to restrict HIV positive migrants and basically was calling for you know people with HIV to not be allowed into the UK, which as I understand is not something that the UK has ever considered, um, which is, you know, a, a badge that we should be proud of. So um, probably the action that we've taken, which had the um, biggest amount of uh, press attention so far, was we basically got together and said, uh, Farage is lying. He's spreading bullshit, basically, pardon my French, that's completely uninformed. And he has a very big media platform. Most people don't know how um, uh, medication has changed the situation for people with HIV. But they will listen to Nigel Farage when he mouths off on the news. This bullshit has to stop. So on World AIDS Day, we went and got a, a bunch of cow manure. And uh, that's actual cow manure that we dumped in front of UKIP's London office um, with the slogan, what goes around comes around, UKIP stinks. And I mean, this image went viral um, and I think got a lot of people to our meetings and got Mr. Farage very upset. And I actually think they shut down this UK office um, in London. Uh, the UKIP office in London after that. Um, as you know, if you listen to any of the leadership debates, Nigel Farage continued to harp on this um, HIV migrant theme, basically employing scaremongering tactics. And, you know, s some of the smaller parties, the Greens and Clyde Cymru and um, the Scottish National Party stood up to him. But notably, I think Labour and the Tories in particular did not. Um, in addition, you know, we've been challenging the idea of stigma uh, within HIV. This is a bunch of us wearing um, T-shirts that we made that say, I have HIV asterisk on the front and on the back it says, in my body, in my bed, in my community, and on my mind. This was part of the um, East London Fringe Festival, with which Will was one of the organizers of the sexual health events, that, and, and, and we were part of it. But, you know, our... our um, 
sense of being in a, in a gay space in, in 2014 and wearing these shirts was very shocking to realize the kinds of reactions that we got um, from certain people as we were trying to talk about um, whether they would consider having you know, sex with someone who was undetectable or whether they knew about um, various prevention measures and people just didn't want to talk about it. And I think that's highlighted for us that issues around silence and stigma are perhaps even more prevalent um, now than they might have been in 1992 because people are probably uh, less aware of people who are HIV positive than they were in those days. And there's a lot of kind of distancing and self-stigmatization that I think is maybe um, one of the reasons behind the rising infection rates. It's, it's worth saying that, you know, our group is made up of a lot of younger people, certainly younger than me in their, in their 20s and early 30s, um, people who are men, women, positive and negative or undisclosing. We do encounter a lot of the issues that were discussed in the film around, you know, communities of color and trying to get a wider representation. But we're in a different landscape now. There are lots of more advocacy groups that exist, and we, we work closely with a lot of those advocacy groups groups, but we're trying to um, really be the sort of political edge that's trying to inject direct action back into um, the HIV activism landscape within the UK. And our other big cause at the moment is demanding PrEP, which stands for pre-exposure prophylaxis. Um, Will is the expert on this as the um, researcher, so I'm not going to talk about the medical aspects of it, but what PrEP is just for those who may not know, um, as you know, there's, there's medications that people who are HIV positive can take to help suppress their viral load and allow them to live. Recently, um, there's a new form of prevention treatment that some of these same drugs can be taken preventatively and they help to um, drastically reduce the ability of people to become HIV positive. Um, you know, for the longest time, condoms only were, were seen as the end of the uh, HIV epidemic. The rising infection rates, we believe, have shown that um, condoms alone are not working for everyone. And PrEP, we feel, um, which is to take these um, uh, medications as a preventative measure, is something that needs to be approved in the UK and in Europe. It has been approved in the United States for a number of years now, and there's a lot of delay. So this is a number of us um, holding blue balloons, because blue is the color of the, the medications uh, under the uh, commercial name Truvada, demanding PrEP now. There's just been a lot of debate about whether it works, and our slogan is PrEP works, we need it now. Um, I'm sure we could talk more about what PrEP is, um, but um, it, there's, there's been a UK study now that's shown it's, that, it, that it works, and we feel that it's, it's really important continuing that fight that the earlier um, activists had um, in terms of uh, medication and, and getting easy access to that. Um, I'm sure we can take some questions and respond to the film. Uh, sorry for this rapid whizzing through of new information for you. Um, I'm just putting that up there so that you can keep in touch with us on Twitter. And then if you do come and talk to us after the event, I've got a mailing list here. Most of our um, work is in London, but you know we want to reach out to people all over the place and it would be exciting to think that um, we can we can start mushrooming more activities around the UK. Um, that's all that I have to say. I don't know if there's anyone who wants to um, ask a question now within the group or respond in any way. Um, and I don't know how much longer we have in the space. Okay, great. Yeah, I, I think probably it's small enough that as long as you speak loudly, yeah, anyone you know will be able to hear. Is there anyone who'd like to ask anything or, or respond to what they've seen? Oh, here comes a microphone. Uh, thanks. Um, uh, what struck me really watching the movie with regard to the contemporary political situation in Britain is um, the current government is trying to legislate against this form of extremism uh, in, uh, in the states when uh, ACT UP talking about seizing the FDA. Um, I think if that sort of language was going around Facebook and Twitter and that sort of organization was happening, that would, that would quite easily be categorized as an extremist sort of action. Um, so uh, I, that just made me think about that a little. But also uh, the contrast between the U.S. Um, I, I was in the U.S. from 1990 to 1995, uh, but beforehand I'd been in Britain. and. Uh, ACT UP in, in London in 1998-1989 was just four or five people in, in a, a 
uh, a room above a, a pub in Soho. And, um, you know, just, just the contrast between what was going on in America and what was going on in Britain at the time. Uh, and it just uh, makes me realize how much Britain benefited from, uh, from the activism in the US during those periods, but also how little coverage there was in Britain of that time and even within the US itself. I mean, all, all the films we see here, here seem pretty dramatic and there's extensive coverage, but I don't think it was covered in the same way in American media at the time and, and probably not in, in Britain. Um, I'm just doing like a wholesale response to the movie as well. Because I, I think as well, what, what is missing in, in Britain and what was prevalent in the States at the time was the, the cultural capital of activists from the recent past in America, from the civil rights movement, from the feminist movement, and from the anti-Vietnam War movement. And, and the way that those, that cultural heritage of activism was inherited by um, ACT UP uh, and, and where that is in Britain now with regard to organization, with regard to the variety of strategies, the tactics, the theatricality, and the targetedness of demonstrations. Uh, so I'm just feeling a bit nostalgic for that, I guess. Mm. Um, no questions. I, 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 I'll, I'll respond um, to one part of that. Um, a, a couple of years ago, I wrote an article about what, what happened to AIDS activism in the UK and that, and that very issue about... Um, Legislation brought in um, at the end of the Thatcher era, then by John Major, then by then by um, the Blair government, that really restricted what we can do on the street, what kinds of activism we can do, and what is now has what is now illegal that we might have done or been able to do 20 years ago. My own observation was that lots of people who were involved in AIDS activism in the UK had also been part of other activist movements, such as the anti-poll tax movement, the anti-war movement, um, for example. And I got the sense that there were a whole load of people who became absolutely shit scared by what the state had started to do to protests. So I saw people in the anti-poll tax movements have their heads split open. We saw people imprisoned on trumped up charges. And again, as I said just now, as we know, as The Guardian has uncovered, most large numbers of the, of the certainly radical protest movements in the UK were infiltrated by, by the police. Um, and we have now fairly compelling evidence that that happened to act up to. Um, I think the nature of activism has changed and has been shaped as a result of that. But I also think that there's only so many times we can do the types of street protests that we saw in the film today. And I didn't want to talk about this in too much detail with that. Me and a, an, an old um, ACT UP colleague called Gabby Kent um, are starting to work on the very early stages of a UK documentary that, will, that may kind of be a little bit similar to this, going through stacks of, of film footage from um, 92 and 93 from the International AIDS conferences. And Alden McLean, who's one of the guys who's featured in, in this film, who died in, in 1994, comments in, in, in that footage that Gabby filmed that it's not sustainable to keep that level of activism going in the same way and we have to create new ideas of doing activism. There's only, it has to be fresh, it has to be new, it has to be eye-catching, otherwise the media don't pay attention, politicians don't pay attention and the people who are trying to get to foster change will stop paying attention. Um, yeah, and I, w I would also just quickly add that I think the landscape has changed. I mean, one of the things that we try to do is we think about what causes to take on and what slogans to use. We don't tend to use silence equals death or the pink triangle because in a way it historicizes what the issues are. And so to choose something like PrEP, to choose something about like the migrant issue and the immigration bill, we're trying to focus on specific things that are happening now, and I don't know if Will agrees with this, but I, I, you know, I think with the availability of antiretroviral medications, I think there became a sense that at least in the West you could sort of medicate yourself out of the epidemic in a way. And so the issues have shifted and changed. We're not fighting for drugs into bodies quite in the same way. So I think as a group we've had to do a lot of questioning and, and soul searching around that about why are we gathering together. And, and you know, it's, it's, it's harder to mobilize people because those people in that film, for all the desperation, that also fueled them, yeah. you know. Um, but but I, I do think there is a resurgence 
students, it is interesting to see a lot of younger people um, coming out and, and starting to care about this again, even if the questions and the targets may have somewhat changed. Any other questions or responses to the film or to what we've had to say? Yes. Um, I also wondered um, about the kind of emotional landscape of ACT UP because I know also there's been a lot of reflection and it comes up also in the film about being united in anger and, the, and sort of um, res restricting but also mobilizing around a particular kind of um, set of affects or emotions and how on the one hand that's so important but also feeds the kind of question around the multiple kinds of experiences people have with AIDS which are as we saw, depression, mourning, you know, um, jubilation, desire, you know, there's, there's so many other kinds of um, experiences. And I think in my, uh, in my own experiences with ACT UP members over the years, that's been a really important set of questions to answer as well, is like, does the, can the anger kind of sustain itself for that long, or, or does at some point it have to become a more complex picture in terms of the, the emotions that drive activism? I mean, it, it, yeah, I think for our, for our chapter, we're young enough uh, as, a, as a, you know, a year and a half of, of major activity that we're still struggling with a lot of that. And, you know, I think there are different, there's a spectrum within the group. I mean, we had a lot of debate about how to deal with Farage and how directly to target him and sort of how we reach consensus around those kinds of things and are we more accommodating or are we more aggressive and you know even people who unite around some of these issues ha and and people come with a lot of different stories I mean I think you know, there's actually a surprisingly small number of people within the group who are openly HIV positive, and it's inspiring that there are so many people who are allies of people who are HIV positive that care about this issue. But then I think those other people come from a very particular place that a lot has to do with maybe shame or seeking some kind of community where they can turn their sense of isolation into something that feels communal. And so I think we have to take care of those members and think about their particular needs. There's also, you know, issues and needs. I mean, we, we, we constantly ask ourselves about why there aren't more, um, for instance, uh, women from African heritage who, who respond to the work that we're doing. And, and I think one of the issues that we have to understand um, is that all people have all kinds of different complex needs around childcare, the time that they can give up to activism. And and so, you know, I think we're constantly struggling with how we define ourselves and what, what motivates us. But I think um, we're growing and we're learning and trying to listen to each other. And there are often times where we don't listen to each other very well and we get very frustrated. Um, but that's sort of the nature of this kind of thing because we're all essentially doing this um, uh, out, of the, out, of, out of our passions, as, as you're saying, whether those are passions of excitement, anger, grief, mourning, or solidarity with, with one another. I think those emotions can be very powerful, but for me, I, I got totally burnt out by being surrounded by people who were always angry and always, want, always, always wanting to pick a fight, always wanting to punch, and I, I don't actually mean physically punch. We have, Gabby and I, in the videos we've been looking at recently, have a, a really, I think, for me, a really good illustration of, of how anger-driven activism can be really dangerous. We were at the, the Berlin International AIDS Conference and we were doing a big demonstration um, against Virginia Bottomley, who used to be our Minister for Public Health, and she'd made uh, substantial cuts to some of, the, some of the HIV budgets. And we wanted to shame her in front of the international press at the conference. So we had a, a Berlin um, drag queen dress up as Virginia, Virginia Bottomley. Um, and we had uh, placards that spelt out Virginia Bottomley's name. And if you're not aware of this Virginia Bottomley, an anagram of Virginia Bottomley's name is I'm an evil Tory bigot. So we had Virginia Bottomley and then we all ran around to have I'm an evil Tory bigot. And then um, we had huge checks made um, and a big bonfire. I mean, who thought of this idea of having a fucking bonfire in Berlin and burning things? So we had these big checks that said, you know, Terence Higgins trusts uh, £100,000, someone burn, you know, puts them in and starts burning them and then London Lighthouse, someone 
someone burns them, body positive Manchester, someone burns them. And then during the conference, there had been a couple of guys who hadn't been allowed into the conference who were um, what a Jewsberg theorist. They're, they're Jew, a Jewsberg is a guy who has articulated that there's no link between HIV and AIDS and that it's a big conspiracy. These guys were standing outside the conference, you know, really pissing people off. And suddenly this German guy, we've got all of this on camera, this German guy is really, really angry and basically sabotages a whole UK demonstration by just saying, oh, we've got a bonfire here, let's burn the stuff from the Jewsbergs guy. And off camera you hear this whole kerfuffle and then they grab all these materials and they start burning books in Berlin <laughs> and suddenly this chant starts, burn the bigots, burn the bigots. Burn. And I'm like, well, okay, you've just single-handedly, through your anger, totally destroyed what could have been the most fantastic demonstration ever. And for me that was the point when I was like, I'm done. I'm, mm -hmm. Unless we can have activism that's thought through, strategic, well planned and and that's what I loved about those affinity groups. You had affinity groups of people where you, you, you'd had those discussions, you'd had the debates, you would have worked out how you pushed that guy out of the pitch and said don't be so ridiculous don't try and sabotage our demonstration but someone so driven by anger by what he was seeing going on was able to totally, sorry that was a long circuitous story but there you go yeah I, re I remember in the 90s, the, um, maybe, maybe it was just the people I was hanging out with, but it was much more conspiratorial, wasn't it? The, the, the theories about, about the powers that be. And, and I've been reading, Eve, Eve Sedgwick has written about this a lot and, and saying that actually, conspiracy or not, because the effect's the same, it kind of feels conspiracy. It's a conspiracy that we've internalised somehow. I just wondered if... if I'm, I'm misremembering history, which is very, very possible. Or, it, or if it was actually more conspiratorial than that, that film suggested. You mean in the sense of... There, there were more conspiracy theories around... Around uh, HIV being a, 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 a tool of yeah. oppressors to destroy marginalised groups. Being purposefully manufactured mm. for that reason. In the same way, kind of, you know, heroin was introduced to control... Right, right. Yeah. I live in Tower Hamlets, I believe, didn't used to believe in any conspiracies, but I believe them all now, so... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you do hear it a lot uh, in certain... I mean, I don't tend to believe in conspiracy theories about anything, but all you have to do is go back... I mean, I'm speaking from the United States context, all you have to do is go back and watch the rhetoric of conservative politicians like Jesse Helms, and they're extremely happy that this particular epidemic targets black, poor people, and IV drug users, and gay people. You know, they're, whether or not it's a quote-unquote conspiracy introduced um, specifically by the government, I don't tend to think that that's true. Uh, medical research has proved that that's not true, but I can imagine how it would feel that way, particularly at a time in a country like the United States where none of those people had health care or political power. And, I mean, I think the, the first title card in this film says that Reagan didn't say the word AIDS for however many years. When you think about, uh, you know, Larry Kramer sometimes has a, has a fact that he talks about how there was a relatively mild case of Tylenol at some point in the, in the same time period um, ha killing uh, I, I don't know, a couple dozen people, maybe 12 people and it was on the front page of the New York Times something like 25 times and there had never been a story. I, I'm not I don't know the exact facts but the what I'm saying is like those numbers of people dying and the mayor of New York and the government the president of the United States not talking about it. You can understand why people would think if it wasn't a conspiracy it was at least something that they were in support of because it was doing away with undesirable populations. On that happy note, anyone else have any other comments or questions? People want to um, hang out a little bit longer. We have a little bit of wine and, and stuff, so mm -hmm. we can, we'll just be outside in the hallway if you want to kind of have a more informal discussion about the film. And, and, um, but thank you so much to Brian and Will for coming and, and talking and bringing it into this space and this time. I think it's really important. And just quickly, if anyone is in uh, London for Gay Pride on the 27th of June, please do come and march with ACT UP if you're looking for people to march with. We have a bright and exciting new banner made by...
made by Ed Hall, who's quite a well-known artist and banner maker, and we're really excited to launch it this year. So if you, if you write to us on this um, email address, we can get you the details of where we're meeting, and you can march with newly reformed ACT UP London. Thank you. Thank and you. sign up on our mailing list. Yeah, we'll have it. Thank you so much.